Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome, PCOS. PCOS is a common condition affecting 5% of women of reproductive age. The syndrome gets its name due to the common sign of multiple ovarian cysts on ultrasound, hence polycystic. However, in PCOS, a patient does not necessarily have to have polycystic ovaries. What do I mean? So basically, PCOS is diagnosed by means of the Rotterdam criteria. In order to diagnose PCOS, one must have two out of the following three criteria. The first, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Two, oligoovulation or anovulation. Three, hyperandrogenism. So let me explain. Starting off with polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. So to look at the ovaries, it is best to perform a transvaginal ultrasound. The definition for a polycystic ovary is 12 or more small follicles in an enlarged ovary. So keep in mind here that there are actually multiple follicles and not cysts. These follicles will characteristically lie at the periphery of the ovary, just like a pearl necklace, and hence referred to as a string of pearls appearance. Next, we have oligovulation or anovulation. So in PCOS, ovulation does not occur, anovulation, or occurs infrequently, oligovulation, and I'll be explaining why this happens soon. So essentially these patients will have irregular periods and may suffer from infertility. Next, we have hyperandrogenism. So again, I'll be explaining shortly why they have high androgen levels. But essentially these high androgen levels will result in the patient to have acne, hirsutism, which is excessive growth of dark coarse hair in a male-like pattern, and male pattern baldness. Okay, so that was a quick overview of PCOS. Now let's move on to understand why this happens. So unfortunately, the pathophysiology behind PCOS is not completely understood. There is certainly a genetic component, and we do know that it is attributed to two main problems. Number one is very high levels of luteinizing hormone, and number two is insulin resistance. And we're going to be looking at these two in turn. So I definitely recommend that you brush up on your knowledge of the menstrual cycle before getting into this. You can have a look at my video on the menstrual cycle, which I'll link over here. Great. So let's start off by looking at the high LH levels. So first, just a quick recap here. So during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle, we have the growth and development of a follicle into a graphene follicle with its Tika cells and granulosa cells. The Tika cells have got LH receptors, which produce androstenedione in the presence of LH, and the granulosa cells have our FSH receptors, which produce the enzyme aromatase. The aromatase allows for the conversion of androstenedione into 17 beta estradiol, which is a type of estrogen. Okay, so how is this different in PCOS? So basically, in PCOS, as we said, we have too much luteinizing hormone being produced from the anterior pituitary gland. Double the amount of FSH, in fact, of follicle stimulating hormone. So, these high levels of LH will bind to the LH receptors on the Tika cells, resulting in high levels of androstenedione to be produced. Some of this androstenedione will be converted by aromatase into 17 beta estradiol, as we can see over here. However, there will be a lot left over, which will spill into the bloodstream, therefore resulting in our hyperandrogenic state, resulting in the symptoms we mentioned before, like acne, hirsutism, and male pattern baldness. Now, androstenedione present in the blood will reach adipose tissue. Here it will be converted by aromatase into estrone. Estrone has a negative feedback effect on the anterior pituitary gland, therefore decreasing levels of FSH. Because LH levels are very high, there is no LH surge and therefore no ovulation, 
What do I mean? So the LH surge is required for the ovum to break away from the graphene follicle, that is ovulation. Without this LH surge, the follicle will persist in the ovary and appear as a cyst or it may degenerate with the other follicles. Good. So next, let's have a look at insulin resistance and how this plays a part in the pathophysiology of PCOS. Okay, so insulin resistance is when cells in the liver, adipose tissue and muscle become insensitive to insulin. Therefore, they do not take up glucose from the bloodstream. And this can therefore develop into diabetes. As a result of the high glucose levels, the pancreas tries to help out and secretes more and more insulin. And this may cause some people to develop hyperinsulinemia. Now, the theca cells we mentioned before have also got insulin receptors. So insulin will bind to these theca cells, causing them to grow and divide. Therefore, with more theca cells, we will have more LH receptors and it is thought that this in turn stimulates GnRH pulses in the hypothalamus for further secretion of LH. That's not it. So also the high levels of insulin will also result in increased production of androgens from the adrenal glands, as well as reduced production of sex hormone binding globulin from the liver. Therefore overall, resulting in increased levels of androgens, enforcing the state of hyperandrogenism in PCOS. Okay, so this is what a typical PCOS patient will look like. She may have acne, hirsutism and male pattern baldness, all features of hyperandrogenism. She may have irregular periods and may have fertility problems. This is secondary to problems with ovulation as we discussed. And she may also be overweight due to insulin resistance. Next, how is the diagnosis of PCOS made? What investigations do we take? So we take bloods and identify very high LH levels in comparison to FSH levels. We take testosterone and identify high testosterone levels due to the hyperandrogenic effect. A transvaginal ultrasound is also performed to look for the polycystic ovaries. However, as we already discussed, she may still have PCOS without having polycystic ovaries. Very good. Now, finally, how do we manage these patients? Weight loss will reduce insulin levels and improve all PCOS symptoms. So this is the mainstay of treatment. If fertility is not required, the combined oral contraceptive pill will regulate menstruation and treat hirsutism and acne. Clomiphene may be used to induce ovulation in patients wishing to conceive. Metformin will reduce insulin levels and is also an insulin sensitizer. Antiandrogens such as ciproterone acetate and spironolactone can be used for androgenic symptoms, but patients must avoid getting pregnant while using these drugs. Okay, so I know this was a lot of information. I really hope that this video was helpful. Leave a comment, like and subscribe. Thank you.